like we've built our money around this zero sum game of fiat inflation extraction, right? Where it's one person has a shrinking piece of the pie, the other people have a growing piece of the pie, and that's the competition. But real production isn't that way. Real production is bringing human energy, human creativity, and skill together in a way that grows the pie as a whole, right? Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to another episode of the Nick and Griff Show. Today is Saturday, August 10th. It's 8.59. Oh, it's 9 a.m. Change right on the dot. 9 a.m. on the dot. Griff, tell me a little bit about what you think in Fiat Land this week. I think it was summarized perfectly in our car ride. Uh, Nick and I text all the time. I don't know if Nick is on this train, but I know when the price goes down, everybody buys the dips. I buy crazy dips. Like when I just see the world kind of acting stupid, I'm just like, huh, probably like should buy some Bitcoin because it's still making a lot more sense than everything else. And I uh, have to say, since the last time that I personally was on here recording, wow, uh, wow, very good. Uh, we like it. We like the comedy fest. You know what I mean? It feels like everybody's kind of doing their own stand up routine. Uh, it doesn't feel like anybody's making any logical decisions, uh, which it's kind of great that we have this episode today because we need some logical decisions being made we need some uh good election outcomes we need to move this country back in a pretty good direction because the nick and griff show is uh we are an american podcast american made uh we do root for this country but my gosh it is uh it's hysterical honestly i mean everything everything in the policy you know, world time, is time preference is uh is a big topic of of thought for me um time preference and how we're making decisions, right? Um, what this the current state of the union is, if you will. You know, if we want to take action, we want to make things quote unquote better, right? However you define better, that's a whole nother conversation. We have to first identify where we're at today in order to start making some progress, right? In order to start charting the path. And then I think as we start taking faithful action to, um, to head in the direction we want to go, the, the steps start illuminating themselves when we're doing that faithfully, right? And um, uh, man, you know, something that's interesting that I have never seen tied together before are two completely different things that may actually be more intertwined than we think, and that's soil and money. What What's your first thought on that, Griff? Soil and money, how, like how can these two be connected, you know? Just from my many hours in the car listening to podcasts, um, it's important. It's as important as energy. And for my understanding, the way we use soil in America is about as smart as we are using energy. I mean, I think they're on like parallel, it seems like, in regard to the retardation uh, from a policy standpoint and from a, like what's happening in their standpoint. I know there's some good things happening, uh, but I only say that because I've listened to the Joe Rogan podcast and he's like very big on regenerative agriculture, or at least he talks about it a little bit, which kind of leads us into today. Joel with Untapped Growth is here with us today. Joel, I hope you're having a great day. How are you today, man? Doing good, man. Just got back from Montana, which was a long ass trip, but man, it was beautiful up there. Yeah, you uh, you spoke at a conference there, or is that right? What, what, was, uh, what was in Montana? What's going on in Montana? Yeah, so I've been bouncing around the country the last 10 days. First, I spoke at an Oklahoma regenerative ag conference where I was on a panel. Then I jumped right up from there up to the Shield Arms Field Day that was up in Montana. And I had a speaking slot up there, too, which was really fun. That place was gorgeous. I've never been that far up north before. And the place the conference was at was at a uh, basically a place that's a nonprofit being used for helping um, v- like uh, veterans. And it was in the middle of this old growth ponderosa pine forest, like up in the mountains, little stream kind of bubbling alongside the edge of the property. Oh, man, I spent so much time out there just like baking in the sun and jumping in the freezing mountain stream. It was That's awesome. awesome man. That sounds great. How were how were the conferences? How were the, the talks that you were presenting? So the panel at the regenerative conference in Oklahoma was good and fun. Um the conference was good in that there's a lot of people interested. There's a lot of energy around the whole gen of agriculture thing. But it was also kind of frustrating for as much media hype and attention going to regenerative agriculture that it is. 
there are so few people that really understand how what's going on and how they're doing things. Um, it's just like the real cutting edge guys in this world that I've been blessed to actually have become friends with are a solid probably 10 to 20 years ahead of what's being taught in the advanced grazing classes at these local state level conferences. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. They're slowly starting to ask more of the right questions, which is a big progress from where we were about five years ago. But I spent half the conference talking to like one or two people that were moving the right direction. And then the half of it just pulling my hair out because I'm frustrated about what's coming out of the academia world when it comes to regenerative ag. But we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. I um, have I have the local um, conservation commission and a lot of the extension office people here in Oklahoma coming and doing regular pasture walks at my place. And every time they're out here, especially the extension office people, they're like, well, you know, this is never going to work because A, B and C. And luckily, they've been willing to schedule about every 90 days with me. I'm like, OK, OK, I'll see you guys in 90 days. They're like, well, that worked. But next time this isn't going to work <laughs> like okay okay let's see you in 90 days as long as they keep talking to me i'm getting them there but it's a little bit of like trying to flip world views where it's like they don't even realize their presuppositions are off mm, mm. oh man that's okay that's a huge that's a huge thing right there you know we have so many things that we are kind of assumed as given variables right i actually i wrote about this uh as i was reading through your article i was taking some notes and one of the things I wrote down here, uh, you talk about soil being the base productive asset of civilization, right? And yep. uh, and that this is such an important topic, but most of us uh, assume that this is just kind of a given variable. It is a variable. We know that our, our um, that the state of our soil, and then also the 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 fruits that come from that that soil. We know that that is a variable factor, but we all kind of assume that as a given. Talk a little bit about that. And then also, before we get too far down into it, what is regenerative agriculture for somebody that has no idea what you're talking about? Good questions. They kind of stack around top of each other. So soil being the base productive asset of any civilization, you have to think about like where does energy come from in the world? Where does value come from in the world? What is actually productive of actually building or creating life in the world, right? Not just what is in our current economy, right? Just like financial churn of turnover of just velocity of money changing hands. That's not actually adding to the infinite sum game, right? Like we've built our money around this zero sum game of fiat inflation extraction, right? Where it's one person has a shrinking piece of the pie, the other people have a growing piece of the pie, and that's the competition. But real production isn't that way. Real production is bringing human energy, human creativity, and skill together in a way that grows the pie as a whole, right? So soil, it's that first place where we're working as stewards over creation itself and get to play an infinite sum game. When soil is managed effectively, going back to the regenerative agriculture, which I'll answer in a second, you're creating actual value in the world greater than the sum of its parts because you're able to build up long term fertility for the future and grow production of like a food that can be consumed today. And it's adding to the world due to our stewardship, where we as humans are the keystone species, right? Be fruitful, multiply, go and take dominion. That because of our intervention and stewardship, it's actually growing the size of the pie of what's available of energy in the world. In the case of food production, it's caloric energy, right? Um, so I would define regenerative agriculture as the proper management of our soil and ecosystems to where we're playing infinite sum <laughs> games where we are maximizing the efficient capture of solar energy and balancing the stock to flows between capital stored in the soil as future productive energy, which also provides resilience for the system as a whole, and flows of food produced for today. And so like a lot of people always ask these questions of like, could regenerative agriculture feed the world? Don't we need all these chemicals and all those things, right? Um, I covered some of this in the article, but I mean, even as... Even as long ago as the 1970s, most of farming was energy net negative in the U.S. It was taking three to four units of petroleum fertilizer energy 
to grow one unit of caloric energy of food, right? That's not actually productive. We're putting energy in and getting less energy out, right? Versus regenerative agriculture, if we define it like I just did, which is the maximization of efficient solar capture to balance stock to flows, you actually are ending up with systems that are as efficient as they possibly could be when well managed. So for me, easy example, my neighbors and the properties around me, the Oklahoma average for carry capacity cattle is one cow per three to four acres of land. I ran my numbers a week or two ago when I was sitting around that conference pulling my hair out because I was bored. We're currently over 1.1 cows per acre. And we're only two and a half years in on management. It's going to probably double again next year and the year after-ish, somewhere in that timeline. So I'm already three times more productive than my neighbors are. So it goes back to like this whole LARP of thinking that treating the soil and the productive engine of our ecosystems and actually like the farms as a machine, we treat that as if it's more productive, but we're not looking at it through a lens of reality as a whole. If you're injecting more energy than the energy you're getting out, it's not actually productive. It's it's a lossy energy equation. But when you return to good first principles, you're producing more than you're putting in, which is actually more efficient than the standard commercial and industrial farms out there, which is uh, the way it should be. I mean, if it's the base productive asset, you want to actually be producing something, not just extracting petro energy from fertilizer that was extracted somewhere else and losing that energy in the equation, right? Mm. Explain that a little bit because, uh, you know, there's this idea of, you know, we plant a seed and it grows up. Uh, obviously, that's uh, extremely simple. Um, and it's, give us a couple of, of thoughts or examples of what it looks like on the industrial fiat, you know, producing crops out of the soil. What does that look like in terms of um, in terms of the means and methods? And then also uh, your idea on the infinite sum game. Uh, it kind of makes me think, uh, you know, in, in all of these areas, really every pretty much most areas of our lives don't have an end date. Uh, think about our relationships with our friends and family, our careers, purpose, however you look at it, your finances, your physical health, spiritual health. These things don't have an end. And so we can't really focus on sprinting that race. We have to focus on a pace. We have to set a good pace in place so that we can continue to roll. And I, I want to steer away from using the word sustainable pace because that could get all twisted up in this context. But just focusing on the pace in, the, in that infinite sum game, I think, is kind of what you're talking about in terms of regenerative agriculture, yeah? Okay, so let's start with original settlers moving into North America. European Europeans came over. North America is near idenic looking to them. You, like you read the journals of Lewis of Clark and some of the original settlers that are like, wow, like this place is just freaking incredible. Where does all this food and animals come from? And what it was is was a misunderstanding of different systems of a worldview of how to approach food production. With European farming methods of cropping, they come in, they till the soil, they plant the seeds, it grows up, they harvest it, rinse, repeat, right? And so what tillage is doing is you're coming in, you're turning over the soil to where you're flipping it. You're exposing this top layer of the soil anywhere from like 8 to 16 inches or so worth that is exposed to the air. And what that does is it causes it to rapidly kind of like almost compost. Like, you know, like you got a compost pile and you throw all your food scraps in there, you go and turn it every so often. And that air access causes it to heat up. What you're doing when you till a soil and turn it over and expose it to air like that is you're exposing all the carbon to the air and it burns it up basically. And as it burns it up, it turns it into energy available to plants and then it gets consumed. And every time you burn it up, you're consuming more and more of that soil versus the Native American type of land management system we discovered when we arrived in North America was more permaculture based. It was like food forest when they'd walk in the trails, they'd uh, plant things around where they thought was good for something like by planting berries or a fruit tree or something. If they were hiking their trails, they saw a fruit tree they wanted to give an ad advantageous like an uh, edge to. 
they would break off the branches of the trees that were shading it. If they had to like use the bathroom, they'd go use their human waste to fertilize things. They would use controlled fires and burns to manage the land and the prairie and move the bison around. They'd even do things like installing like berms and different kind of like landscape features to herd and move the bison as well to like change the migratory patterns. Um, it was a system where they were thinking kind of of just how do you put in leverage to manage it as a whole, not how do we put in one single thing we want to grow and then churn it over quickly for immediate production, right? So in a standard industrial farming system today, you come through, you plow the soil, you put the seeds in the ground, and then when it sprouts, you put fertilizer on it, and then you continue just to pump external product into it in order to actually get it to grow. There's all sorts of problems with this. I mean, one, what happens when you can't get fertilizer inputs anymore, either because of economic viability, which we've seen happen to a lot of farms that have gone bankrupt post-COVID and the supply chain disruptions, or just fertilizers destroying the soil food web, which is that life that's creating that energy in the soil. Um, like I heard a podcast that was quoting Christine Jones the other day, that it's actually starting to be discovered that herbicides, which are used to control the weeds in the field, are actually destroying more of the soil biology than even tilling the soil does. Because everybody's always thought tillage was the really bad thing, but even just the chemical is killing the life of the soil. And so we're putting in external energy, and in doing so, we're both burning down the life of the soil through turning it over and burning up the carbon, which flushes it with biological life for a short term. And then we're trying to control what's growing using herbicides and pesticides to avoid basically unhealthy plants not growing effectively. And in doing so, we're diminishing the life of the soil because it's killing the underlying biological activity of what like would be referred to as a soil food web. Versus the way I'm doing things is I'm taking a big picture approach of what are all the different aspects of the system as a whole? How do the microorganisms work anywhere from the bacteria to the fungi to the arthropods? all the way up to like, how do I keep this plant associated with the biology to where they're collaborating together in the extraction of nutrition for this, from the soil that the plant needs and while the plant is growing, how does it feed back into the soil so it's symbiotic rather than purely extractive as a whole growing cycle, right? And you're constantly keeping an understanding of how do we feed the life of the soil versus turn over fast or extract from the soil, right? Does that does that make sense as a difference there? Oh yeah, it definitely makes sense. I was gonna ask, uh, just because that historical example, it was that was really I thought that was just really cool. What are some of the greatest pitfalls of this energy negative tilling herbicide? Like what are some of the worst examples that you can think of off the top of your head, historically speaking, that this is kind of caused and I guess like what would like the normal person what are some examples that like even a normal person would know? Uh that were kind of caused by this. So you look at the Midwest, most of our topsoil is gone. Where previous in American history, we were known as the breadbasket of the world, right? We had this great inheritance of fertile topsoil because of the great plants and the bison that were rummaging across them and these big herds, right? But this is not an isolated phenomenon. Whether you're talking modern times, which is more intense because of the scale at which we can do this with the mechanized farming equipment, the tilling and the giant sprayers and the chemical inputs. This is a pretty standard phenomenon in history where you have all empires go through this phase of when they're a healthy society, they have a long time horizon and they're focused on stewarding the productive assets, whether that's their businesses and things where they're actually building things and kind of like as a even pre-industrial society start to have some industry it's just not scaled into the specialization aspect or storing energy in the soil is fertility for the future and what's always happened in history whether you talk the aztecs whether you talk rome they start to plow higher and higher up the hillsides when they stop caring for the fertility of their soil down the bottomlands and they destroy that and then typically it just gets more and more fragile because they're pushing deeper and deeper into 
the hills and the slopes and the areas where erosion are more prone because they've used up the fertility in the areas that are actually easy to farm. And then they undergo some sort of trigger event, almost like we did back in the Dust Bowl. Right, We had economic crisis, but also a farm fertility crisis at the exact same time. Funny enough, right? Soil money. Huh? Um, what happened then is we had been using up the energy in our soil through tilling over and over and over. And one of the common practices was that when you don't get moisture deeper into the year, in order to protect the crops, what they would do is they'd come through and till between the rows of crops to turn over the soil moisture, to put a little more moisture up and accessible to the plants, which would keep them alive until the rain came. But back to the idea of extractive behavior causes increases in fragility until you have some sort of disruption event that just shows who's without pants when the tide goes out, right? And so they turned the soil over, hoping rain would come. And this year, rain never came. And then you get all the wind erosion because everything just dried out. And then the wind just blew all that dirt out, right? So you look at a lot of America today, we don't have a lot of topsoil left, which is a common phenomenon in history in late stage empires. And that's where you descend into foreign imperialism and actually trying to get value extracting from external societies because you're not producing or stewarding value back home. And then eventually that stops working and the angst of the empire turns inward against their own people, which is what happened in Rome and many other places. And you're starting to see that happen in the U.S. today. Does how that make long, sense? Yeah, how long does it take for uh, topsoil and land in general to kind of come back to its natural state or a state in which somebody like yourself can kind of fix it, more or less? So it used to be taught that it took about 100 years to build an inch of topsoil. Wow. Which is terrifying because we're losing topsoil at a rate much higher than that yeah. and at an accelerating rate. Um, due to the work of some key people in the industry, um, one of which would be like Elaine Ingham, another one would be John Kempf. Um, Elaine Ingham's done a lot of work on the soil food web, which is basically the complex dynamics, all the different microorganisms that are a part of the soil. And so she's really studied how they all relate and their interrelationships between the bacteria and the fungi and the earthworms, the nematodes, the arthropods. And one of the things she's figured out in her life's work is how to do a system that she calls biocomplete compost teas. So like they can do something like manufacture compost through certain very skilled mechanisms that is a lot more whole and balanced than what you would typically find of like most compost. They're lab tests underneath the microscopes and looking at the different ratios, all the different types of things in it for if it's the good fungi or the bad fungi, if the bacteria and fungi are in balance and all sorts of little like very, very kind of deep nuances. And they've learned that you can take that compost, put it in what's called a compost tea brewer, where you've got a big funnel type thing with water in it. You hang a little tea bag full of this compost in it and you run air through it and kind of turn it over and bubble it. And then you feed it with things like fish emulsions or humic acids or different compounds that feed certain types of biology from that compost tea. And it forms this big, just liquid like tea that is all the soil biology that you need for the soil to actually thrive. And there's certain types of sprayers that can spray that liquid tea out onto the soil in a way without killing the biology. And so you can inoculate the land with all this life and it gives it that first piece it needs to kind of just start springing back to life again. So that was one big breakthrough of figuring that out, which really speeds up soil repair. Um, John Kemp was the other one. What he figured out is that soil is a two way street where healthy soil makes healthy plants but healthy plants also make healthy soil. And so what they've discovered is that you can actually foliar feed plants with a, like basically like a, like an algae or like um, seaweed based kind of like, um, like compounds where they break it down to where the minerals and things are really accessible. And so rather than feeding nitrogen or chemical based fertilizers, they're just feeding this kind of mineral support of what a plant would be getting through its roots through the leaves and it's been shown by them that it enables the plant to function at a higher photosynthetic capacity 
much like it would if the plant was growing in healthy soil. And when those plants do so, they're actually able to produce excess energy that is not just for their own growth, but to feed the soil itself and pump sugars and root exudates and like fats and things that the biology of the soil needs for the soil to actually blossom into full life. So wow. now you've got two things. You've got soil inoculation with the laning gum style compost teas. And then if you really wanted to hack the process, you've got John Kemp style foliar amendments to get the plants photosynthesizing so that not only are the soil and the health of the soil there with all the life feeding the plant, but the plant is photosynthesizing to feed the soil, which gives you a lever arm to kind of get to that winch pin point of like where all the leverage is in the system and just jump it forward. Um, what they're showing with some of their research is that you can take kind of burned out terrible soil and get it to like a deep black, rich, pretty like like well well reaching into the soil soil profile of this living soil in even like two to four growing seasons. It's incredible how fast it's possible. Um, but the mental model I would say here is that basically an ecosystem in the life of the soil is basically like a, it's like a flywheel. There's a lot of weight to it. When it stops spinning, you have to build that momentum back up again, just like how a flywheel is heavy and it takes a lot of energy to get it turning again. And then once it's turning, it keeps turning. And to get it turning either takes time or it takes energy of effort of input. And that energy of effort and input is knowledge and kind of the skill to manage that stuff, as well as understanding how to feed it with the biology or the mineral support of nutrition that the plants need to kick that flywheel moving again. So those are the two paths, either you're patient with proper skilled management, or you put some capital energy into it of using these skills and tools that are being developed to restore soil faster. What percentage of farming is the former and what percentage is the latter? in America today, would you say? The bulk of farming in the country today is just extractive soil destruction. Then you've got this subset you're seeing in the media of regenerative agriculture. And honestly, this sounds kind of doomer to say, but all most of them have done is stop the destruction, but they're not really working very effectively on restoration. Well, they got There's my a, dumbass. They got my dumbass because I'm listening to Joe Rogan thinking we're doing something productive <laughs> and we're not getting anything done. So they, there, they there, <laughs> there was a lot of bad research done that came out yeah. of academia early in the times of regenerative agriculture. And this is part of why there's so much doubt about re whether regenerative agriculture works because everybody's following these principles that was developed by the early research that was done. And continued research has shown that a lot of the principles being applied doesn't actually cause carbon or fertility buildup in the soil and an increase in soil life. And so everybody's like, oh, well, all of regenerative agriculture doesn't work. It's just a scam. Let's just do things the industrial way. Well, sort of like just because the industry has standardized over the less than useful practices doesn't mean that the premise as a whole is wrong. We just need to root out the bad research and the bad teaching that's been done to actually get to the underlying principles, the way that guys like Christine Jones, Elaine Ingham, John Kemp, and those types of people are doing. So if we take a step back then here, so we're, we're kind of talking about uh, high time preference as opposed to low time preference, high, pre high time preference being imperialistic extraction. That's the high time preference approach to agriculture. Uh, the low time preference is vibrant production. Those are kind of the two contrasting ideas you've got there. But doing that with at a pace, right, that en enables us to continue on that path as opposed to, you know, running it down to the ground. So now let's zoom back a little bit. Again, if you guys have not read Soil and Money, go read it. It's a great article. The subtitle, though, on this is the two major patterns that define the history of civilizations. So we've talked a lot about soil. Where does money come in on this? I know we talk a lot about the incentive structures, how that impacts our, our, our thought process, our approach to life, the paradigm, the worldview that we operate within. So where, where Joel, do you guys make the, the connection between soil and money? The connection is when a nation changes from production to being unproductive 
to trying to sustain itself from extraction rather than value creation. This manifests in the soil first, but it transmits to every other industry eventually. Like you think about America, a lot of us know about the deindustrialization, the shipping of our actual production overseas. That started with the rural collapse of agrarian America, and then the deindustrialization was next, and then we financialized. So you see this in history when you have a bureaucratic empire growing in size and then an increase in time preference and all the other things that go with the late stage culture, whether you're talking hedonism or slovenliness and on and on. That empire is always trying just to get it, keep itself alive and grow bigger. You can see that whether you're talking about the different bureaus and agencies that are part of the U.S. government, or you can see it in late stage Rome, where it gets more and more top heavy, right? And when the nation's not producing real value, how does it feed itself? Well, typically it starts first with expanding out into the world some, trying to conquer more peoples and then extract from those peoples, like whether that's like uh, we can talk easy mental model there would be European, European colonialism that was the non-beneficial kind. I mean, some of the colonialism was useful. They would stabilize these people groups, bring order and structure in a way that enabled them to bring their skills forward in order to add value to the world. But then you have other instances in history where, like, um, like I, you've probably read Breedlove's article, um, Masters and Slaves, where he talks about agri beads and the little woven cloths which i'm currently forgetting their name they would come into a different civilization and they would say this group was using these little blue beads as their money they'd send the word back to europe like hey these little blue glass beads they use here are really rare and it's the money they use spin up a factory over there and just mass produce these things and ship them to us we'll ship you stuff back in exchange and so then they counterfeited the money used it to purchase up all the actual production of this little society and then ship that all back to Europe, right? And so they tyrannically just consumed the production of that society and collapsed the economy through counterfeiting of money. And typically societies will do that first to foreigners and then domestically because they'll start coin clipping. So like in Rome, what they did was they had these dollar coins or whatever you wanted to call them back in those days that were gold or silver and they started decreasing the precious metal content whether it was clipping the edges or changing the um, actual composition and diluting it with other types of metals right and so there's less and less metal they keep the metal for themselves to fund the government and the people who are using those monies are starting just to bleed value to the empire itself because they're starting to receive in exchange for their money money that's actually in a physical hard manner worth less and less in the well, u.s we've done this through printing of money which is basically just a more abstracted form of coin clipping right so that's the transition from productive economy agrarian industrial to extractive first you reach out to other nations through counterfeiting and cunning military reach to pull energy from them to yours to feed it and then it turns back not just on clipping and paying and weaker currency into the world, but even domestically extracted from your own people and then trying to use that money to maintain your imperialistic might. And then we could get into the details of like how the U.S. has had this happen if you guys want, like the Dutch disease of the U.S. dollar topic, but talk and stick back to you guys. Griff. Well, no, I mean, I just, it relates to today too, I feel like, obviously. I mean, the largest producer of fertilizer, I believe is Russia. We kick them off of the Swiss Swift system, which is like some form of monetary abstraction or whatever you, I mean, like, you know, whatever, however, whatever category you want to put that in dumb or monetary, whatever. I don't really think they're making a 5D chess move. I just think they're stupid. So like, it's, it just seems like a pretty stupid move, but uh, I yeah, guess. When, when you've got a nation that maintains its power by other people using your system and playing the game on your board. Yeah. To erroneously kick a player off that board makes every other player think the same might happen to them, which right. is a lot like a lot less likely to keep people using that board to play their game, which diminishes your own power, which was not necessarily the most intelligent of moves in the long term. Yeah, no, but it does seem like we're heavily vested in uh, making things chaotic 
I don't know. I heard Putin say one time, he was like, you know, he's like, we would get in a propaganda war with the United States, but he's like, we don't want to get in a propaganda war with the United States. And I kind of believe that because I've never lived in another country, but I couldn't even imagine the stories that get spun in other places to justify whatever it is that we're doing. But back to kind of the economics of it, can we get to a society where it is a hundred percent regenerative agriculture? Can we get to that kind of world here in America? Is it kind of like a drill baby drill situation? Can we just go full fledged into it or how long do you think tra that transition would take? That's a really hard question. Yeah. Um, let's, let's cover the Dutch disease thing. So it's just right there and it feeds right into the answer. The term comes from Holland. They discovered oil. And what the government in Holland decided to do was to basically go out and extract that oil and then sell it. And they used the income from that oil to give universal basic income to all their citizens. Thinking there was that it was going to lead to this productive boom in their society. And everybody had more money and value so they could go out and invest their time in craftsmanship and arts and entrepreneurship and being creative and just their society was going to flourish. The absolute opposite happened. Everybody got lazy. It stagnated everything. They deindustrialized and exported all their industry out to the rest of the world. In the U.S., I would argue that we have Dutch disease, but we have Dutch disease for the natural resource we discovered, natural resource that we could export is the fact that the rest of the world's willing to use the U.S. dollar. So we're selling dollars to the world. We're getting value back when everybody plays on our board and uses the money as far as like the game of economics of the world itself. And it's enabling us to pretend that we live in a productive society. We have industry that basically is energy net negative, like farming that's true across a lot of our economic industries of production of lots of different things. And we're maintaining a quality of life just based upon the fact that the world's playing on our board that makes us wealthy because of it. And we've exported a lot of our inner industries consequentially to that because it's just the same thing as what happened as Holland. It causes a, fl a flush of value in the system that breaks the incentives of actual like, creation. Um, very much back to like the early Americans saying, if you don't work, you don't eat, right? Well, now nobody's working and we don't realize it. <laughs> um, and that's that's kind of the root problem here where let me lay out the landscape for you when it comes to farming which i know pretty well because it's the industry i'm in age of the average rancher in the u.s is 58 years old 89 percent of ranches in the u.s are between like one and 100 cows average herd size in that tranche of cows cow herd size is 22 cows nearly every one of those farms is a subsidized hobby farm that's just a side business that the land and everything is paid for from the other person's main career. Most of those operations are bleeding equity, but they just raise cows for fun. 10% of ranches in the U.S. are between 100 and 500 cows. 1% of ranches in the U.S. are over 500 cows. The real scary statistic, 6% of ranches in the U.S. control 31% of the land and produce 75% of the beef. It is hugely centralized. So the problem is land has basically monetized because in a soft, a safe Dean says it best, right? In a soft money world, everything has to become money because the money itself is weak, right? And so much like it's not useful to use gold or viable to use gold as a productive asset when it comes to like, say, electronics or manufacturing, because it's worth so much with the monetary premium, it's just kept in a vault somewhere because its monetary use is better, like more profitable than its industrial use. It outcompetes the industrial use as a gold when gold's money. The same thing's true of land, where the productive value of the land is outcompeted by its monetary premium. So you've got this aging population of ranchers, you've got inflation that ran away from the younger generation. The young generation can't afford to buy into farming because they can't afford the capital costs because land monetized during their lifetime or their parents' lifetime. So there's no young people stepping in at scale in the U.S. to take over producing and farming because they can't afford the buy-in. Land can no longer pay for the carry costs of the land because its productive value 
is no longer measured based upon production or its actual sales value is no longer measured on its productive value be more accurate way to say it so like even a lot of educational classes in farming these days what they teach is to treat the land as an investment and treat the farm as an operation that's just leasing the land but that breaks the incentives because if you're leasing land you have a short time horizon to maximize flows of production for the day versus capital stocks of fertility for tomorrow because the land owner's interest and the farmer's interest have now been atomized. So you got these layers of problems there where you stack into that the next piece, which would be government subsidies. First, you've got government subsidies and insurance over like crops, right? We incentivize growing lots of corn to be turned into ethanol, which is yet again another negative energy net negative industry. You're putting three to four units of petroleum energy to grow one unit of food energy, and then you're converting that back to petroleum energy again. Who knows what the lossiness is between corn back to ethanol? <laughs> that equation is just horrendously inefficient. And so we started with subsidizing grain, and then we had the insurance and all that kick in. So now you got farmers who are basically filing for losses on their crops, and then you get paid twice because you get the insurance claim. And then you send the cows out to eat the grains or you chop it up in silage and feed it to the cows. And now you're putting that value back into the cattle again. And so this is common enough that it basically depressed the prices of grain, which distorted the industry to where we bred cows basically to be pigs that we shove cheap grain into rather than cows being on marginal land, converting lignified carbon into meat and soil. And so it broke our cattle genetic base. OK, that's one huge problem that needs solving. Our cows are no longer capable of grazing in tightly packed herds like their wild ruminant ancestors and grazing intensively and non-selectively in a land that's in a way that's beneficial for the land. OK, layer that into another aspect of subsidies. You've got in my county in particular right now, I was just talking to some of the people who know my neighbors around here. You've got solar panel companies and wind farm companies coming in and offering to lease land in order to put in their quote unquote green, green energy stuff. They're offering in my county $2,500 per acre per year. Either one of you care to take a guess at what the grazing lease of per acre per year a farmer pays to use land? It's between $35 and $50 per acre per year. Oh, wow. wow. To put that land in the use of the green energy industry, it's almost 100x. I, like, I couldn't run the math that fast in my head, but it's a huge differential. That's so the wild. problem there is... All that green energy is just government money. It's chasing the cantillon effect of snuggling close to the money printer of what the money is being printed with no marginal cost allows the oligarchs to dictate what they want to happen in society that's completely disconnected from reality. So okay, I want to I want to I want to pull the reins real hard again and then let it go. And I want to do that by reading a, a quick piece of of soil and money here. So you start out. Um, kind of laying laying a little bit of the groundwork on, you know, here's kind of what we're going to look at. And then you start off with the, the your first subheading, the three base psychotechnologies of society. You write, let's begin with brass tacks. When examining our current civilizational woes, we must first venture to define the elements that compose a successful civilization. At its base, civilization is defined by the coordination of large groups of people working together to scale and perpetuate the cultural values that define them. There are three key tools that enable this to occur. First one is language. The second one is fire. And the third is money. And you define language as the ability to communicate about what your desires are with others, right? Makes sense. Fire is the ability to leverage, harness, and utilize, you know, in, in, uh, energy in the pursuit of our collective desires. And then money is the kind of combination of the two where it gives us the ability to communicate, coordinate in a distributed manner about how, how strongly something is desired and who is best equipped to efficiently and effectively spend their energy or consume their en en energy in accomplishing that thing. So uh, I think, man, what these, these three pieces, language, fire, and money, are really interesting. So give us, give us a couple of thoughts about that. So exactly what we're talking about, right? You've got the oligarchs spending money through government subsidies to incentivize what they want happening in the world, but it's incentivizing foolish behavior that doesn't connect to reality. So we've bred cows that aren't cows. 
we're using land for things that are energy net negative. Like most solar panels and wind farms have more embodied energy in the concrete, the steel, the extraction of the minerals and things used to build the panels on and on that they require more energy to make than energy they ever produce in their entire life cycle. So the fact that the communication mechanism that's designed to balance the relationship between desire and the energy efficiency of accomplishing it has been disconnected from reality disincentivizes healthy behavior in society. So tie that back to the question of, can we transition back to regenerative agriculture? Well, as long as we live in a society where the main communication mechanism and tool of human coordination is incentivizing foolish behavior that doesn't actually respect reality, probably not. Guys like me, we're living strongly contrary to the economic incentives in society because I believe that there's going to be a reversion at some point where the foolishness stops. Problem is, as the old day trader saying goes, the market can maintain ir irrationality longer than you can stay solvent. How many people could do what I'm doing where I've got a strong community that believes in the shared heart and purpose of what we're doing, where we live contrary to the economic incentives, knowing that one day an opportunity is going to arise where the world's going to need things that actually make sense again whether that's talking about the genetic base of cattle we're building, when everybody needs to move over to these cows, it'll be an opportunity to provide them. Or the fact that the fragility of our food supply, if we are resilient, when that time comes, we'll have the production still happening, which is another competitive edge itself, right? In a place that's good to be and just about to care for people in general, even if you don't try to like make a ton of money on that opportunity. That's the hard part. We have the knowledge, granted the knowledge is siloed in a pretty narrow subset of people in regenerative agriculture. Simple example, which I've been ranching since about 2020. Going to that conference the other week and building friendships in the industry, um, we launched a like a Facebook group around all dry density grazing the other, like about a month ago. It's up to about 3,000 people around the country that are in it. The more I've gotten connected in this industry, the more I'm really realizing how small the number of people are that actually are at scale doing things in a, an actually effective manner. I know five ranchers in all of the U.S. who with any form of scale are grazing things in a way that actually rebuilds the soil quickly over long periods of time. That's tiny. That's absolutely tiny. And I'm connected well enough in the industry. I, I, there's definitely people out there I don't know about, like guys off in the wild who aren't really on social media probably. But just by that subset, that is honestly kind of terrifying. I'm probably one of the 0.01 or 0.001% top grazers in the U.S. after four years because I was willing to ask the right questions in a way that few other people are. And that's kind of terrifying that the industry is that far off doing things that don't really make a lot of sense. So the education's there, but it's not really penetrating because there's too much misinformation in the academia world, misleading people down false trails. And then the economic incentive stacked on top of that, incentivizing bad behavior in regards to how we relate to reality. So we could fix it, but it probably won't be fixed until the incentives are fixed, which is why I'm a Bitcoiner, because until you tie money back to production with real marginal cost, that's unforgeable costliness, right? You're never going to have the discipline of proof of work of tied to real reality back in economic behavior again. As long as we have a fiat money, the foolishness of the oligarchs leveraging the Cantillon effect of the financialized economy is just going to incentivize everybody to, rather than chase wisdom, to chase snuggling closer to the money printer. <clears throat> and that's how they get you. I mean, like, it's the same thing. I work in healthcare. They do it through the insurance companies and they do it through Medicare. Medicare sets the standard for all the other insurance companies. What are doctors supposed to do? They got to make a buck at a certain point in time. So whatever code gets them the most money, that's very often what you see being done most of the time. Uh, extrapolate that out to any, uh, any procedure you can think of that insurance company is covering right now. And I mean any they're incentivizing the worst of the worst. And you never know what it's gonna end up like with lawsuits and things like that. I don't know how that goes in agriculture or the, how that goes in other industries, but uh, at least in healthcare, uh, there's gonna be a lot of deformed bodies, I think over like the next 10 years. 
And there's going to be a lot of lawsuits because there's going to be a lot of people upset about it. And the only reason why they're getting done is a little bit of propaganda, a lot of bit dollars. And it seems like it's kind of, it's relatively the same thing. They, they're very good at this. Uh, it is, it is uh, disappointing, though, that there's not a lot of um, small practices. There's not a lot of doctors who operate in a small practice either anymore. It's just very difficult uh, to do these kinds of things. Uh, are there any Bitcoin well, companies related, like involved in this type of farming, or is there any like Bitcoin mining companies? I don't, I don't know. I'm just like picking off the top of my head. Or is there anybody from that side of the community like involved on a, any kind of major scale? Well, so let's talk farmer real quick, since it's right yeah. on the topic. Yeah, I mean, go back to COVID, right? This is what they were getting incentives for diagnosing people as COVID positive, yeah. and then for resmitivir and ventilators while you're suppressing ivermectin so it incentivized a behavior that they wanted happening in the world and we'll we'll avoid the tenfold hat of why that was but it stopped the knowledge leap of how to actually help people because rather than somebody having answers and then people flocking to them for the propagation of those answers the doctors responded just by chasing the monetary incentive the power of the money printer and the Cantillon effect is a real monopoly of power in the world that really changes behavior. Hey, hey, you've mentioned it several times. For the folks that don't know, will you just uh, give a quick explanation what the Cantillon effect is? Good call. Um, Cantillon effect is basically the economic phenomena where the people who are closest to the propagation of the dissemination of money are those who benefit from it most because they receive access to more value that they can play with in the world before everybody else does when it trickles out to the rest of the economy. So they're basically participating in the economy with inflated money before inflation takes place so that they're basically continuously getting cheap prices, which is a large, large advantage in economic competition. Which uh, also to make a connection to something you mentioned earlier, a um, little bit on subsidy. Uh, I read an article yesterday that I posted on Twitter about universal basic income, and they actually did some studies on this uh, that they referenced in the article that I read. And they talked about how, um, you know, they they kind of sell it as this idea of, oh, you know, here we'll give this money. It'll increase production. People will be spending more. It'll be more of a productive base. Um, and what the research found was that was true in like year one because people yep. were just spending, right? And then as as the market found new equilibriums with that, that more money, right, um, then prices just rose and then there wasn't really actually an increase in anything because there is actually, uh, contrary to popular belief, there is a work that has to be done in order to produce some outcome and or, or in order to produce something that we need to consume. But anyways, wanted to make sure that we define the Cantillon effect there. So you think about that, you're giving money to somebody, you've got small business owners who are being purchased from with the goods and services they provide, but the increase of price to the change in size of the measuring stick is always slower. So they got a disadvantage where their profit margins are getting eaten up by the fact that they're behind in the measurement of their value based upon how the game itself is being played, which disincentivizes actual production. Um, Griff, can you go back and remind me of the question you asked before I dove into the medical stuff? Um, it was it was more along the line of basically incentives. We were just talking about incentives and how, and at least in healthcare speaking, it is insurance or Medicare now from the early 2000s that drive pretty much all the incentives that you see. So like any, so I was basically saying how any surgeries that, some people would deem less than ideal that are going on right now. They're really only happening because doctors are people too. They got to make a paycheck and it's, it's hard for them to run their private office. And you were going to go farmers because it's kind of the same thing. It's like these doctors, they, they can't, they can't do what they want to do in a lot of cases. Uh, they have to do what make ends meet. And I'm assuming you were going to go off because there's probably a good parallel for um, everything that you're involved in. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the same thing you were talking about, why do small practices and medical, why didn't they push the envelope is still trying to stick to doing the right things just because they just believed in it. Well, right. I can't tell you how many doctor friends I have who got brought up before the medical boards, the Sanhedrin of like, hey, you guys can't do this, right? Where wow. even because they wanted to do the right thing, they lost their license. Um, and in farming, 
the whole industry exists to support the foolishness. I mean, whether you're talking about the extension office and education complex that farmers rely upon, that's teaching the wrong things, whether you're talking about government support programs that are basically like trying to move the needle forward, but they are just so far behind. It's not even practically useful for somebody like me. Um, <clears throat> like I'll go in and talk to my uh, guys who are supposed to be my local extension office guys who are with the offices that are basically the go between between academia and then the guys in the industry are doing the work and they're supposed to help us figure things out how to manage our farms and systems well basically none of them can answer my questions because i know more than all of them which is incredibly frustrating um and in the farming we were talking about the subsidies for solar panels and windmills and things like that and there's just layer upon layer here where not just the economic incentives, but even all the educations and the government support programs and just on and on and on are so far beyond or behind the edge of the people who actually know what they're doing that it's honestly even just counterproductive, even though they're trying to solve for the right things. The money's being spent on stuff that's just not helpful, even if the intention is to use the continuum effect on things that are supposed to be helpful. And the only way to fix that is, let well, me we, we give a little bit of context. The Cantillon effect incentivizes people who are good at playing bureaucratic games of ass kissing to climb up the chain and compromise on the real productive things they know to just play those social games to climb up the ladder to get closer to the financialized incentives. It used to be that profit was a measure of competency because if you were more competent, you'd be more efficient and better at reading quickly. What is the thing the market desires? Back to money being a synthesis of language and fire. Knowing what the market desires in a distributed manner and getting an edge on figuring out how to efficiently and effectively satisfy that desire. And the people who could satisfy it best were the ones who would get the edge of profitability, right? That's no longer true. The people who steward money in our economy now are either those who have snuggled close to the money printer and have unfair advantages. Easy thing there would be the whole meme of Nancy Pelosi making millions because she knows the stock trader tips are going to come out before the world does. Um, gambling. I just, saw, I just saw a meme yesterday. And it said, "It said Nancy, Nancy, how did you make how did you make X percent in in the last six months?" And she said. The secret ingredient is crime. <laughs> exactly. Or like gambling on things like meme coins, right? Back to Weimar Germany, everybody was a day trader talking to the guy polishing their shoes about what they're going to step into and like, like gamble on next. Um, and so you've got this huge centralization of the stock market where like the top seven companies have basically monetized and everything else just inconsequential in value. It doesn't tie to reality at all anymore. Um, and so you have ass kissers, bureaucratic ladder climbers, and gamblers at the top of the hierarchy who are the ones disseminating value into the world to try to choose what the world needs. There's not going to be any problems with this third or fourth order consequences, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure that there won't be. Yeah, those people are going to have a lot of wisdom to know exactly what to do in the world. <laughs> um, and so even if you have a society... This goes back to communism and why it's idiotic. That's trying to define the goal and solve it. It's never going to be solved because those people are idiots. You rather would have people who have been through the school of hard knocks of solving the real problem of how do I effectively solve the desires of the world in an energy efficient man man manner be the ones who accrue that power of profit in order to make decisions in the world. And this is where our society has just had this slow creep to where we're honestly not a capitalistic society anymore. It's just hidden communism through the fiat mon monopoly over the money printer. And it's just done in a way where it looks capitalistic, but it's not. And I don't really think there's a lot of hope until we destroy central banking, destroy money printing, and allow the hardship to occur that is wrestling back to reality living based upon a hard money system that ties to truth again. And once again, like all these industries I care about, this is why I'm a Bitcoiner. 
I love the soil. I love the ecosystems. I love productive industry. And if I want America to get back to being an international power because of being the breadbasket of the world or a industrial manufacturing powerhouse where the creativity and skill of our people are unleashed again, we need the fools to stop being the ones who are making the decisions. We need the people with the bottom who have the skills to actually be rewarded for their efforts again and allow the basic decentralized intelligence of our people to come forth. And as long as you're suppressing that with foolishness at the top of the hierarchy, that'll never happen. So you wrote this article by uh, posing a question, and that question is, so what can be done? And you, you, you put together a succinct list of three things. Griff, I want to hear your thought on these. First one is abandon the fiat dollar. The second one is to raise large families of moral citizens. And then the third is to restore the soil. I think that, you know, Jerome Powell and whoever the Department of Agriculture is, you know, whoever's the head of that in the Paris Biden uh, organization, I, th- I think they probably know what's best, you know, and they're probably going to do a really, really good job. Uh <laughs> Organizing society and making sure that the cream rises to the top. No, um, <laughs> you started saying I, that, and I was like, "Wait a minute, where is he going with this?" No, I, uh, no, I, I'm just, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna reach a soft landing. You know what I mean? That's what money swaps with Japan means. We're gonna have Vaseline. There's gonna be lots of Vaseline. We're not gonna have to worry about it. I think that uh, it's kind of just an overarching theme. Meaningful change takes a, a while. Meaningful change takes a while. Um, Unfortunately, those at the top have no incentive to look on that time, that kind of time horizon. And that's the society we're living in today. So if you are trying to do the opposite, uh, you might benefit thanks to Bitcoin and thanks to, I mean, honestly, I, I think woke culture dying, a lot of uh, cancel culture, woke culture, just like a lot of that stuff. There's like a definite divide within this country that. Some people don't like the divide. I think the divide is good because at least that means there's some people that are sane in some respect. And I'm not talking politically speaking. I mean, there's people that know that the money is broken and there's people who don't. And that's good because at least there are people who know it's broken. And I'm like, hey, should probably, you know, I don't know, maybe not listen to what I just said about Jerome Powell and not think. Hey, that pause. Gr- interesting thought, Griff. I had a conversation yesterday with with yeah. a lady uh, that is a big left Democratic supporter. Um, she said that what, and she was kind of cryptic with what she was saying because she was kind of tiptoeing around it a little bit. She said that in the last couple of weeks, and you know, there's been some changes referencing Joe Biden dropping out, Kamala being, you know, on the stand. Uh, she said that she felt like since, since that has happened, that the country has actually started to come together. And I was like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, how about we what get a- another round of beers? How about another round of beers? You know, I was like, um, I don't know how that works. I don't, I mean, I feel it, you know, I mean, I'm out here in California. Gavin Newsom is cleaning up, uh, the freeways, you know, he's picking up trash, which is great. It's great. <laughs> we only spent $27 billion. Okay. $27 billion, uh, whatever. It's fine. We spent $9 billion to try to build a road, you know what I mean? Or like a, a, railway from like northern california to southern california um so i think at the end of the day i i think that the things that we're talking about today will prevail if i was if i had enough capital uh i would want to get in things uh where we're often bringing on people like today that are talking about an industry that is probably set to change because logic and reason does it matters i mean at some point it matters because if we start starving or we have to like beg yeah, we got, I mean, we got a serious problem on our hands. And I hope that, I don't know how you kind of push this thing because the government hates it. The government probably wants us all to eat like bugs or something. So I don't really know how we're going to combat this. Uh, I don't know if you can do it with your vote. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you can buy Bitcoin. And I think that kind of takes money out of the system. But I'm not sure exactly everything that we can do. Hey, I Joel, just, give us a parting thought on a couple of these last uh, ideas that we're talking about. And then where can the people find you and get connected with you? Yep. Okay. So exiting the fiat system. I mean, thank God for Bitcoin. This is a heavily Bitcoiner styled show, so I'm not going to go too deep in that. Um, 
we're all stuck on the hamster wheel of modern society to some degree. And it's going to be a challenge to get off of that because the rules of the game are defined around a system we don't believe in. And you have to keep playing the game in order to have any sort of chance of over overthrowing it or changing it. So I define this basically by what I call like the, the story of the golden handcuffs. There's two groups of people. There's those people who are, for any given reasons, unwilling or unable to take off the golden handcuffs. But they're still trying to help support the emergence of a better world and building resilience for their families, knowing the fragility of the world they exist in. And then there's another group of people that are able and willing to take off the golden handcuffs and try to jump into creating a new reality. Those two groups have to stop behaving as enemies when we talk about how we're going to change the world. They have to work together. And the argument that I continue making in our community around our farm and initiative is that none of us can really change things with our short-term cash and short-term energies because there's too much momentum in the world today where we can't just stop playing the game in the immediate. But if we put our long-term energies towards a goal set that's different than purely economic incentives, we can begin building a world that gets into the position to capitalize on the opportunities when it goes back to being wise rather than foolish again. So example, how many guys do you know that have the retirement accounts on their 401ks and they're spread across some different ETFs and whatevers that are largely probably managed by BlackRock and are buying up houses that are going to be leased back to your children and make them slaves? Okay, what if instead we took all that long-term savings and energy of our lives, put those things in self-directed IRAs, and supported small businesses of people like my group of people who have taken off the golden handcuffs and are trying to forerun real solutions. So for us, we, uh, we're doing what we're doing because we launched what we're calling a herd share program. We have our main big herd of cattle that we're breeding to actually go back to being able to solve the dual purpose of cows, to be food for today, meat, and the keystone of economic re or ecosystem restoration. And so that's a big problem because the genetics of cattle in our country have gotten so perverted due to bad incentives. And the herd share program allows people in our community to own breeding stock of cows. Every year when we wean off a calf, we split the calf. So the farm gets the bulk of that calf to fund itself. They get some of that calf as real yield. So now they own breeding stock in perpetuity because we replace it with younger generations over time, just over and over. They have a hard asset that's a real asset. It's uncorrelated from any sort of inputs because we don't have to use fertilizer. We don't have to use feed. We're breeding cows that don't need medical inputs or care. So it's completely inside of a trust network with no third party risk that's not relationship based because those people all know us and we've developed trust. There's no bank bail-in risk and other nonsense. There's no exterior supply chain risks. And it has real yield or real production measured in more cows. And so these families are really excited because where else can they have value stored inside of a tribe of trust that has real production and resilience of food security for their families? And so putting our energy together has allowed us to jump the chasm. I've got a buddy who says that farming makes sense really small scale, which just like chickens in a backyard garden or really big scale and middle size is just no man's land. So by doing it together, we're able to undo the atomization and actually jump into forerunning, living by a different set of incentives to solve the real problems because we share a belief set together of what's important in the world beyond just purely maximizing financial gain. Okay, and then what, raising large families. There's two key soils in a society. There's a the soil itself and the soil of the human heart. Like if you go back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis, right? The name Adam that God gave to the first man, it's actually an alliteration of the word red dirt. And so if you want to have a productive civilization, you need two things. You need soilwood industry that's actually creating value. And you need people that are competent and moral to keep the gears of trade working. Because without trust and relationship, there's no exchange because you can't work together. And so it takes more morality and trust in order to have really fast and liquid trade in a society. And when morals devolve, so does business opportunity because so much is lost in the churn of bad relationship. So large families of productive moral mm. children 
is That's how we get good. back to having a good society again, right? And this goes back to why are they importing in so many like foreigners, right? Well, they're bringing in people to overwhelm the native population. Birth rates are down, partly because of just, once again, lack of vision, hope, morals. Um, you guys familiar with Canine Reaper and him documenting the collapse of South Africa? He's, no. he's an account worth following. Um, him and I have had some conversations, and in them I boiled down three basic tenets of successful society shares. One is hope for the future. Two is taking pride in their work. Three is care for their fellow man. To have a functioning civilization, you have to have all three. When all three are lost, that civilization is going to collapse, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. In order to fix it and launch it back again, you have to restore all three. Just one or two is not enough. Hey, we're, we're an hour and 14 minutes in. Dare I ask the question, where is God in all of this? <laughs> That's a Maybe, great question. Hey, let's just, let's actually, let's pump the brakes on that. That'll be the next time that you come on the show. Um, okay, so continue on raising large families of moral citizens. Um, I'll answer super concise. It's the work of Christ through the new covenant to excise our fallen nature of self-interest to enable us to live per a higher set of rules to be more than what we currently are where we take our freedom of our will to serve truth goodness and beauty in the world where like the apostle paul said it i do that which i don't want to do and i don't do that which i do want to do who will save me from this wretched mess that i'm in it's only through god and christianity that we're able to truly return to the fullness of freedom and value creation in the world that being able to operate as productive creators and rulers and stewards of the world that's around us. Mm. And then third, this is the idea of those moral people returning to real production again, first with the soil, but then back to all industry. So that's how all three of those tie together. And that's what we're going to have to do to restart a productive civilization. So back to what we're doing, you can find us at smokeoverranch.com. Um, if you want to support the mission that we're doing here, I would love to talk to you about herd shares. You can pull it up on the website just underneath that herd shares tab, learn more. And then there's a spot to send me an email where you'll get the deeper information. We can chat about it. The more people we have putting their energy rowing forward with us, the more I could jump that middle scale size that's no man's land and scale up actually solving these problems. The way that we talk about it is that so many people are hungry for like the back to the land movement and a lot of these things to return to a more relational and grounded way of life, kind of return to pre-industrial society way of being. The problem is, is that pre-industrial societies always get steamrolled by post-industrial societies because post-industrial societies weaponize scale against them that they can't compete with. What's unique about what we're doing is through coming up with unique systems of human coordination, we're leveraging pre-industrial style relationality and trust, which is getting off that contillion effect of chasing the wrong incentives and getting back to solving for what each other cares about again. But through these unique systems and doing it together, we're scaling the ability to actually compete with post-industrial size against what's happening so we can create real change. So, I'd love to have more people jump on the ship with us. We've got a lot of solid proof of concept down I can share with everybody. And we're rocking and rolling. And the bigger you help us get, the better we can forerun real solutions here in the world. All those links will be down in the description. Griff, parting thought for Joel. What do you got? I feel like it's always cheating running this podcast and just getting to learn so much about a different industry or something that I genuinely... I tried to learn something about it. I promised before I got on here and made a fool of myself in the first five minutes. But uh it's hard i mean like it's hard unless you actually take the time to talk to somebody and learn about it so i'm glad i did that today thank you sir and i appreciate it thanks for having me on guys it was a pleasure another great episode uh interesting thoughts i think i think one of the coolest parts here that we talk about is um is the incentive structure but then the three psycho technology bases for civilization which is which were language fire, and then money. What an interesting kind of connection to make between all of these things, right? We've got to have language so that we can communicate what we value, um, whether that's a that whether that's an economic value, a spiritual value, right, in terms of morals and ethics. Um, 
we have to be able to communicate right in order to in order to coordinate together to produce on a on a on a large scale um on a civilizational scale and then we've got to be able to harness energy uh which is the fire element we've got to be able to harness energy in order to actually produce the things that we value that we've communicated about that we value and then and then how do we actually coordinate that and that's the money element and whenever the money is being diluted and whenever the money supply is being manipulated uh larger and smaller um, then what we're communicating and the energy that we're consuming to produce these things really starts to get convoluted and not really re reflect what is true. Um, such interesting thoughts, Griff. What, what, what do you think? Uh, I can't help but think about WTF happened in 1971 just because it's, it's kind of one of those things where you realize you're a part of maybe something that's negative in society, like it's going downhill. And I just find it so funny that there's just like another part with the soil and agriculture and just how we're getting our food and how we're producing some of these things is, dare I say, uh, high time preference, just extremely high time preference. And just like, no, you're not thinking about the future. You don't have any solutions. Where are we going to go? It's like, just add it on. You know what I mean? Add it on to where we're at. And it's, I mean... We have solutions. I think that's a beautiful part about it. I think we have solutions. And uh, our friend said it, thank God for Bitcoin uh, in sense. Yeah, because I don't really think that we can do any of the things that he was talking about unless we have a money supports that type of low time preference activity. And if it takes a hundred an inch of topsoil, I mean, I'm glad we got people trying to speed that along, but meaningful change will take time. And they, and we, this wasn't a conspiracy podcast today, but they, meaning whomever is closest to the money printer, seemingly doesn't, you know, want any of these ideas to spread. They like the way things are going. And here's another industry where it doesn't, it seems fairly definitive to me, like fairly definitive and actually fairly uh, green, you know, fairly climate changey, you know, like he's doing the right thing and the government's actually doing the wrong thing, but whatever. Um... Hey, if you guys aren't watching, we do have video on Spotify and on YouTube, so come see us there. Um, we love to talk with people. We love to uh, tweet back and forth. Come see us on Twitter. It's at Nick and Griff Show, all spelled out. That's N-Y-C-A-N-D-G-R-I-F-F-S-H-O-W. Come see us on Twitter. Peace.